kids are great at reminding us of the things that we said that we would do, right? Most of you know I have three young kids and they're fantastic at this. They can't remember 90% of the things that we tell them, but if we say, we'll go to the store and buy that thing for you tomorrow, you better be sure that the next morning, like as soon as they get up, when are we going to the store, mom? When are we going? Or if we say, we'll go to the park, or whatever thing, we'll play that game with you later, whatever it is that we try to like postpone and put off and say we'll do it then, they will come back because they have fantastic memories for that type of thing. And they're persistent in the reminding of us. Even when we have forgotten we said it, they remember. And Abram, or Abraham as he comes to be known later, reminds me of my kids in his relationship with God in this story, right? This is not, we skipped last week, we were in chapter two and three and we skipped right ahead to chapter 15. Um, but this is not Abraham's first encounter with God. If we rewound a little bit, went back to chapter 12, we would see that God chooses Abram and his wife Sarai and the family they have yet to create. God says, I will bless you, and through you and your family, the entire world will be blessed. It is at that point that God calls Abram and says, get up and go to the land that I will show you. Leave your country, your father's land, and go to the land I'm going to show you. God doesn't even tell him where it's going to be yet. And Abram gets up and he goes. And they, they get to the land of Canaan, the promised land, that's called the promised land, because God says, this land will be yours and your descendants. But not yet. And Abram and Sarah wander down into Egypt, and they get into a couple of shenanigans there. They, Abram gets himself into trouble a little bit with the Pharaoh. They come back up out of Egypt, they go back to Canaan, and God again appears and promises Abram this land far as the eye can see, an offspring like the dust of the earth, so numerous shall his descendants be. And now God appears again. After warfare has broken out between the various kings of the surrounding area, and Abram had to go rescue his nephew Lot and bring him back because he had been captured, and, and this mysterious priest Melchizedek comes and blesses him and then disappears and now after these things God appears again God comes in a vision and says Abram do not be afraid I am your shield your reward shall be great and here Abram reminds me of my kids who um, like lie and wait when I walk through the door after I've been grocery shopping or been at work and boom, they're like, Mom, remember you said this? Did your kids ever do that to you? He says, nephew, did you ever do that to your parents? And it's like Abram has just been waiting for God to show up again, to have this chance to have a conversation with God and remind God of the promise that God made that God has yet to keep. Like, um, that's great, God, that you're, you know, going to be my shield and my reward is going to be great. But um, what is my reward going to be? I'm still childless, God. Whatever you have given me so far is going to go to Eliezer of Damascus, which I guess the custom was that was probably the chief steward of his house. And so the custom would have been that if someone dies childless, then the person in charge of the household gets the household. But Abram says, I have no offspring, God. Didn't you say that you were going to give me descendants? And you know, Sarai isn't getting any younger. I would say that her biological talk, clock is ticking, but the fact of the matter is that her clock long ago ceased to tick at all. She's way past the age of having kids. And Abram is like, God, you promised. You promised. Are you going to come through for me or not? Abram is impatient with these postponed promises. And we can relate, right? We get impatient too, waiting for these things that we think that God has in store for our lives, that we think that God has promised. 
and there are so many times and ways that promises seem to be postponed for us. Maybe not even specific promises. I mean, Abraham has God show up three different times and say, I'm going to give you land and blessing and children. He gets very, very specific promises. <laughs> God doesn't usually show up like that to us, right? So if God has shown up to you like that and told you a promise, I would love to hear what it is. I would love to hear that about that experience have kind of this more general sense of God's promise in our lives. And we have hopes and dreams for the things that we hope that our lives will hold, that we hope that are the things that God wants to give us. And it is hard to wait when they seem to be unfulfilled. I think just over these past seven-ish months since March, when everything kind of shut down, how many promises longed for and hopes and dreams of people have died or have at least been deferred during this pandemic chaos. Businesses have been shuttered and jobs have been lost, homes foreclosed and renters evicted or at least living under the shadow of that threat while there has been a moratorium but knowing this virus lurking where we cannot see it causing anxiety stress even as we try to go about our day-to-day -day lives. There have been milestones that have been missed, weddings postponed, shifted, graduations and proms canceled, first days missed. My nephew's birthday in Pennsylvania was yesterday and they had the big, what is now becoming the traditional COVID pandemic birthday parade where he stands outside and the cars go by and people wave and honk and say happy birthday from afar. There have been final goodbyes that have been missed. With so many lives cut short, over 200,000 in our country now from COVID-related causes, and that doesn't count all of the other diseases and accidents that have claimed lives while resources are diverted to taking care of the coronavirus. Families and relationships are stressed and strained as we are trying to adapt to do it's like this kind of like little shaking of the ground where we're like, Oh, we're changing again, right? These new rhythms of life that we don't want to become new rhythms of our life. We want to get back to our old life. And there have been trips postponed and moves and new opportunities missed. And we are getting tired of waiting in this situation. We are restless for life to return to normal or to as close to normal as it can be. So that the promises that we think that life has held for us, the ones that we expected might be fulfilled in our lives. And the frustration is that God doesn't come to us or to Abraham with any kind of a timeline for that, for the laid out plan of how these promises will come to pass. God doesn't come to Abram and Sarai and say, on this day, in this place, at this moment, you will conceive and have a child so that you may have your own offspring. God doesn't show up to us and say, this is when your waiting will come to an end and your situation will shift, whether that is related to the current upheaval of our world or just in general, right? Because life has not ceased just because all of this is going on. And so there are all of the other challenges of our lives. But God does keep showing up over and over again, speaking the words of the promise, do not be afraid, I will be your shield. Through all of the trials and the tribulations and the troubles and worries and stress and ups and downs of life, now and before and into the future, God says, I will be with you. Your reward will be great. Not just for Abram and Sarai, but again, God comes over and over, saying words like this. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life, and those who believe in me will live. Remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. See, I am making all things new. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. So many words of promise in so many different ways. And the promise isn't that we will have an easy journey 
through this life, God never said that there will not be obstacles and challenges and hurts and disappointments. But God does promise to be with us through it all. And just like Abram, there will be times when we will question God's timing, when we will push back with impatience, when we will tug on God's shirt and say, is it now? Are you going to do what you said you would do? Because faith doesn't mean that we never have questions, that we never have doubts, that we never ask God to hurry up already. But we trust in this one who makes the promise. And that is the call, that is the inspiration Abram gives us for us to lean back into God's promises and to look up at the night sky. Can you imagine the stars that he would have seen in a place where there was no light? in that sky. I found a poem while I was, you know, reading about this passage by a Lutheran pastor and author, Michael Coffey, writing about this piece of scripture, and I wanted to share that with you. He says, Abraham's countless stars hover over our troubled heads. Sarah's skylights enlighten our skittish steps. Our ancestors fill the night sky with testimony. This is not all there is. There is more to come. More than the terra and the ocean. The sky painter who flicks your future on midnight canvas is making space for your story and song. Making and guarding promises still unspoken opening wormholes to times and places unreachable by your linear, downward searching mind. So let that muscle in your forehead go and feel your brow drop and your heart slow and your brain relax and the flow flowing and rock it on through fear until faith is your Milky Way. Rock it on through fear and trust in this one who places the stars in the sky and promises to be with you, come what may, until the end. Thanks be to God. Amen. <clears throat>